ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਟੂ ਦ ਸਿੱਖ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਪੋਡਕਾਸਟ ਦਿਸ ਪੋਡਕਾਸਟ ਸੀਰੀਜ਼ ਪ੍ਰੋਵਾਈਡਸ ਅ ਫੈਸਿਨੇਟਿੰਗ ਲੁੱਕ ਇਨਟੂ ਦ ਸਪਾਰਕਲਿੰਗ ਲਾਈਫਸ ਆਫ ਦ ਸਿੱਖਸ ਫਰਮ ਦ 15th ਟੂ ਦ 18th ਸੈਂਚਰੀਸ ਟ੍ਰਾਂਸਪੋਰਟਿੰਗ ਅਸ ਬੈਕ ਟੂ ਦ ਟਾਈਮਸ ਆਫ ਆਰ ਐਂਸਿਸਟਰਸ ਦਿਸ ਪੋਡਕਾਸਟ ਪ੍ਰੋਵਾਈਡਸ ਅ ਹਿਸਟੋਰਿਕ ਕੰਟੈਕਸਟ ਟੂ ਦ ਐਵੋਲੂਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਦ ਸਿੱਖ ਰਿਲੀਜੀਅਨ ਆਰ ਵੈਲਿਊਸ ਆਰ ਥਾਟਸ ਆਰ ਪ੍ਰਿੰਸੀਪਲਸ ਐਂਡ ਆਰ ਐਥਿਕਸ ਐਂਡ ਦ ਰੀਜ਼ਨਸ ਫਾਰ ਆਰ ਫੈਨੋਮਨਲ ਸਕਸੈਸਸ ਐਸ ਅ ਸਟਰੋਂਗ ਨੈਟ ਵਰਲਡਵਾਈਡ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ to understand the sikh religion and way of life the sikh values and sikhi better i cannot but stress how important it is for us to be aware of our history to know about the times our ancestors lived in sikh history is a wonderful peek into our past that tells us how we came into being both as a people and as a community it is a huge repository of information about how sikhs have evolved in the last 500 years the path our ancestors took to preserve the teachings of the gurus history also has a message for us for all of us living in the present it is simply impossible to separate the sikh identity from the sikh history and the more we know about our past the better we can nurture our present selves the second point about history is that it contributes to our moral understanding in a sense that when we attempt to understand the moral dilemmas that people in the past faced people who have weathered adversity in real difficult circumstances we take away extremely valuable lessons in courage in diligence and about how to shape our moral thinking every day around the world in every gurdwar we do the ardas in which we recount our history a history that connects us to our past gives us the courage to face our present and the confidence to venture into the future with a blossoming pride in our heritage it is only from history that we can learn things that would make us better humans the stories of our past tell us what led to the successes and the failures of people if we leave our history we cannot understand our past and can never lead our future for six the period of early 18th century was one of tremendous upheaval six were always in a state of war against the mughal empire in north india with the result that very few historical accounts were recorded the east india company which had been rapidly colonizing india finally managed to get a foothold in the punjab curious to understand how a small community could stand up against the might of the mughal empire the british wanted to know everything about the six it was necessary for them to understand the might of the khalsa in order to some day establish their reign over punjab a british commander by the name of captain david murray commissioned bhute shah a well known muslim cleric in the court of the mughal emperor farooq siyar to write a history of the six by all means his report was biased against the six a chance meeting between captain murray and ratan singh bhangu set the record straight when murray sought ratan singh's opinion on the six Ratan Singh Bhangu responded by writing the Panth Prakash which remains an authentic source of information on the six in the 18th century the historical significance of Panth Prakash lies in the fact that its author Ratan Singh belonged to a historic family that had experienced various stages of persecution of the six his grandfather Mehtab Singh was one of the leaders of 18th century six and had fought against the atrocities of Zakaria Khan the most ruthless Mughal governor of Punjab also through marriage he was close to the missile leaders by narrating the accounts of six ratan singh bhangu has made significant contribution in understanding the lives of the 18th century six he was the first person to record the history of sikh martyrs in an objective manner and his writings have inspired many a tales of sikh valor and folklore with that introduction in mind let's go back to the founding of the sikh religion and through this series of podcasts gradually trace our steps to the present the history of the sikh starts in 1469 with the birth of guru nanak and can be divided into three major eras we have the period of 1469 to about 1708 which is characterized by the physical presence of the 10 gurus during this period the rock solid foundation of sikhism was laid 
Sikh teachings were revolutionary in that they stressed on Ekamkar, the monotheistic aspect of God, the equality of all men and women, and advocacy for a casteless society. And the Sikh way of life can be summarized as Nam Japna or remembering God in our actions. The importance of Kirat Karni or earning an honest living and Vand Chakna, the practice of sharing with fellow humanity. The second period of Sikh history is between 1708 and 1839, from the short-lived period of Banda Singh Bahadur to the end of the reign of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. This era tested the resolve of the Sikhs to survive as an independent community, distinct from the prevailing society and its norms. The third era comprises the lives of Sikhs since 1840 to the present and modern day, with a look at the partition of the Punjab between India and Pakistan in 1947, the Indian state-sponsored anti-Sikh programs of 1984, and the immigration of Sikhs from Punjab to all corners of the world, forming a truly global community, bound by a common history and the love of the Guru Granth Sahib. Guru Nanak traveled far and wide and wherever he went, he gained followers for his newly founded Sikh faith. These followers had broken away from their original communities, which for example, the Hindus or Muslims or the Sufis, etc. The result was that in his lifetime, Guru Nanak was able to create a community of people who had much more in common amongst themselves than to the communities they had originally belonged to. Kushwan Singh, the famous Sikh author, has proposed that this ideal gave birth to the collective Punjabi consciousness and the Punjabi nationalism as distinct from all others. Guru Angad succeeded Guru Nanak and in his own quiet way he started to consolidate the still infant Sikh philosophy. He established six centers of learning across the Punjab and sent out copies of Guru Nanak's Shabads and hymns to each of those centers. In this process, Guru Angad also created the Gurmukhi script. It consisted of 35 letters, all taken from Guru Nanak's compositions. This step had far-reaching consequences on the Sikh literary tradition and the Gurmukhi script became the nucleus of Sikh writings. It further gave the Sikhs a written language distinct from the written languages of the Hindus and Muslims and fostered a sense of them being a truly distinct people. Almost concurrent to when Guru Nanak was preaching his message of Vaikumkar, at the turn of the 15th century, Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire, had started his invasion of the Punjab in order to establish his empire in India. Babur's first contact with the Sikhs began when his army imprisoned Guru Nanak in Saidpur, a small town near Islamabad, while Guru Nanak was returning from his travels to Baghdad in Iraq. Guru Nanak was subsequently released at the personal intervention of Babur. Although Babur's autobiography fails to mention the Guru, Guru Nanak wrote several passages criticizing the brutalities unleashed by the Mughal army in its invasion of India. Babur's son Humayun came to power during the guruship of Guru Angad and remained indifferent to the Sikhs and to Guru Angad. By the time Humayun's son Akbar inherited the throne, Sikhism was flourishing in Punjab under the guruship of the third Guru, Guru Amar Das, who had established his own center at Goindwal in Punjab. When Akbar visited Goindwal to meet Guru Amar Das, he was so impressed with the way of life in Goindwal that he assigned the revenue of several nearby villages to Guru Amar Das's daughter Bibi Pani as a marriage gift. Political and social relations between the Sikhs and the Mughals were at the best during this time. Guru Amar Das introduced many innovations which tended to break the close affiliation of the Sikhs with the Hindus or the Muslims in India. Prominently, women were given equal rights as men and the practice of sati, the burning of widows along with their husband's funeral pyre, 
was strictly forbidden. Second, recitation of hymns of the Gurus replaced the chanting of Sanskrit shlokas at the time of birth and death. And third, Guru Amar Das advocated monogamy and widow remarriage as means to uplifting the state of women in society. These measures aroused the hostility of the Brahmins who complained to Akbar. While Akbar never interfered with the Sikh way of life, there was evidence now of the strong opposition to Sikh teachings from both the Hindu Brahmins and the Muslims. This was the beginning of the oppression of the Sikhs, their first big break from the Hindu social polity and which subsequently compelled them to take up arms. The fourth Guru, Guru Ramdas, led a relatively peaceful life and composed hymns while consolidating the Sikh ethos in the midst of his followers. His son, Guru Arjan Dev, succeeded him as the fifth Guru and in 1588 built the Harmandir Sahib at Amritsar. It has since become the most important place in Sikh history. By 1604, he had combined the teachings of all the Gurus into the Guru Granth Sahib and anointed Baba Buddha as the first Granthi. In 1606, Akbar passed away and Jahangir succeeded him. Jahangir was opposed to the growing influence of the Sikhs and the political climate suddenly changed against the Sikhs. Jahangir demanded that Guru Arjan Dev convert to Islam. Guru Arjan upheld his right to practice his religion in peace and when he did not agree to Jahangir's wishes, he was tortured to death in Lahore on May 30, 1606. The brutal murder of Guru Arjan was a shock to the Sikhs and when Guru Hargobind took over as the sixth Guru, he had two swords girded around his waist, one to symbolize spiritual power and the other one symbolized temporal. At Gwalior, he cultivated an army of over 800 horses, 300 troopers on horsebacks and 16 men with firearms who were always available under his disposal. His real troubles, however, began after Jahangir's death in 1627 and when Shah Jahan became the emperor. There were now frequent clashes between the Sikhs and the emperor's forces, and the peaceful atmosphere gave way to war cries on all sides. Guru Hargobind was succeeded by Guru Har Rai, Guru Har Krishan, and Guru Teg Bahadur in quick succession. In the meantime, Aurangzeb had become the new Mughal emperor. Although quite learned in the Muslim tradition, Aurangzeb persecuted the Sikhs and was intolerant of other religions. He demolished temples and imposed taxes on Hindus for visiting their holy pilgrimage sites. Guru Teg Bahadur stood up against Aurangzeb's design of forcibly converting Hindus to Islam and paid dearly with his life. Aurangzeb had him executed on November 11, 1675 in Delhi. This was the final straw in the relationship between the Sikhs and the Mughals, and there was open hostility between the two thereafter. Guru Gobind Singh, who succeeded Guru Teg Bahadur, organized the Sikhs as an army. In a letter to Aurangzeb titled The Safar Nama, he wrote, When all other means have failed, it is permissible to draw the sword. Guru Gobind fought many battles to uphold the rights to freedom, equality and justice, the three most important virtues in Sikh philosophy and thought. The first battle was fought and won in 1686 against the Rajput kings who had betrayed the Guru's army and sided with Aurangzeb. In 1687, he was again victorious against the uprising of the hill chiefs who were always looking to gain favor with the Mughals. Notwithstanding the earlier sacrifices of the Sikh Gurus to protect these same chiefs and their subjects from Mughal atrocities. The period between 1687 to 1699 was rather peaceful and during this time Guru Gobind gave the Sikhs the gift of the present day Khalsa. A whole new religion and identity came into being during the Vaisakhi celebrations of 1699 an identity that was focused on the ideals of equality for all humanity, remembrance of God, earning an honest living, and giving away in charity. 
the same ideals first taught by Guru Nanak. It should be noted that Sikhs did not shy away from living up to those same ideals even when the Mughal rulers subjected them to personal atrocities. And the magnitude of these inhuman tortures is just impossible to imagine today. Within a few months, a whole new people were born. They kept their beards, they wore their long hair in turbans, and armed at most times with a zeal to build a new community. The proclamation of the Khalsa in 1699 most certainly made the hill chiefs even more nervous, and they collaborated with Aurangzeb forces to teach the Sikhs a lesson. In 1701, they unexpectedly attacked Guru Gobind and the Sikhs at Anandpur. Their only motive was to evict the Guru from Anandpur, in what is now called as the First Battle of Anandpur. The Sikhs were able to defend themselves. In 1704, they regrouped and attacked the Guru again in the Second Battle of Anandpur. Aurangzeb, swearing on the Holy Quran, offered a safe passage to the Sikhs if they fled Anandpur. However, he later betrayed them and attacked them as they were en route to Talwandi Sabo. In the aftermath, a battle was fought at Chamkor, where the Guru's two elder sons, Ajit Singh and Jujhar Singh, were killed. Also, the Mughal governor of Sirhind, Wazir Khan, apprehended the Guru's two younger sons, Zoravar Singh and Fateh Singh. When they refused to convert to Islam, they were executed. Despite losing everything, Guru Gobind sent a letter to Aurangzeb, the famous Zafar Nama, or the Letter of Victory, where he chided the emperor for his moral weakness in breaking all of his promises and reprimanded him for his excesses in an unjust battle. In 1707, Aurangzeb died, leaving behind Bahadur Shah as the new emperor. Bahadur Shah was somewhat friendly towards the Guru. However, while travelling through central India in 1708, Guru Gobind Singh was fatally wounded by two Pathans. Realizing that his end was near, Guru Gobind assembled his followers and invested the Guruship to the Guru Granth Sahib and urged all Sikhs to look upon the Granth as a symbol of all ten Gurus and as a constant guide in life. The 200 years from the time Guru Nanak founded the Sikh religion to Guru Gobind's founding of the Khalsa Panth can thus be divided into two equal parts. In the first hundred years, the five Gurus pronounced the ideals of a new social order in the Punjab. The religion was accessible to all humanity, strictly monotheistic, derived its ideals from the teachings of the Gurus codified in the Guru Granth Sahib and its symbol was the Harmandir Sahib at Amritsar, a place of worship whose foundation was laid by a Muslim and the structure was built by Hindus and Sikhs together. The second period of hundred years saw the development of traditions that supplemented this new social order. In the next five Gurus, the Sikhs found their martyrs and heroes, a new political order, the Khalsa Panth, all amidst the oppressions and tyrannies of the Mughal rulers. Above all, in everything that Guru Gobind wrote or spoke, there was a note of buoyant hope, the concept of Chardikala, a constant conviction that even if life was lost, the mission of Sikhi was bound to succeed, thereby creating a free, just and equal society. So this was a short introduction to the Sikh history and we will continue to talk about more events in subsequent podcasts. Keep listening. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ka Fateh.